This conference will now be recorded. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're so happy to have you join us. I am Michelle Renee. I'm the Vice President of the Alliance for Massage Therapy Education and uh, so excited to have another conversation with you today. I'm coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, so later in the call, when we all get to talk, maybe we can hear about where people are from. I think that's a a fun part of being able to connect and share our thoughts and ideas. So I will hand it back over now to Virginia to uh, just introduce us to our talk today, and then we'll get started. Okay, so thanks, Michelle. Uh, so I'm Dr. Virginia Cowan, massage therapist uh, and massage therapy researcher, author, and I'm coming to you live from my garage in Rockland County, New York. Um, so <laughs> people who got on early heard about why I'm in my garage today, it's all good. Um, but we uh, have been doing these conversations. Initially, we, we did uh, um, just a conversation for massage educators early on when people were trying to figure out how to get started. Can we move online? Do we have to close down schools? Uh, and, and it was such a nice conversation that was recorded. And, um, and then we were a and asked by some people to continue that. So with the help of the Teacher Resource Development Committee, Rob Kelly is here and Pete Whitridge is here uh, from the Alliance. We uh, ran weekly conversations for a while, and now we're moving into kind of a bi-weekly format. And really the goal is to stay in our lane in the massage community, really focusing on education. So it's primary education as well as continuing education. And um, uh, trying to uh, use the collective brain uh, to empower people and, and have a positive conversation. A lot of what we see on social media is what we see in here and it's anxiety producing and it's quite different across the different states and around the world. So um, I, uh, we have Ed Bolden here today and I think, Michelle, do you have an intro for him? I sure do. Okay, terrific. So pass it on over to you and you'll see me in a little bit. All right. So we are delighted to have with us today Mr. Ed Bolden. Um, as we were preparing for this introduction, Deborah Persinger helped us gain a little bit of insight into Ed's personality. We asked uh, um, some simple questions like, do you have any hobbies? Do you have kids? Do you have pets? And Deborah emailed and said, Ed would have had a pet if he could have adopted a baby gorilla born to the Knoxville Zoo. How funny. However, it turns out that that's quite relevant to today. Baby Gorilla Girl Andy was born at the Knoxville Zoo in 2016, and Ed is a big fan. Zoo officials said the name means brave, strong, valiant, and courageous. Turns out that's a great description of the energy that Ed brings to the massage therapy profession as well. He's the immediate past president of the Federation of Massage Therapy Boards. Ed served as a commissioner for CompTA and was the president of the Tennessee Massage Licensure Board. He is well qualified to review these guidelines for practice with COVID-19 considerations published by the Federation because in his previous life, he was a critical care nurse working with infectious disease cardiorespiratory patients, as well as an instructor in the nursing and allied health program at Georgia Medical Institute in Atlanta. Today, he's a licensed massage therapist and the president of Arbor College School, where he is also an instructor in the program. Ed lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's a father, a son, a brother, and an activist. And he doesn't have any pets, but he is a self-professed geek. Welcome, Ed Bolden. We're so thrilled to have you today. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today. Um, so one of the things that I want to say, uh, just starting out, is that this is gonna be pretty laid back. I run a pretty laid back classroom, so uh, you'll have to forgive me for the informalness of everything. And I'm used to using Zoom, so I'm gonna, just a little different in technology here. So the first thing that I will say is that I'm, I'm not here today to talk to you about the details of the guidelines, but to give you more insight as to how they were created um, and take away some, perhaps some of the uncertainty that people have. We know that that uncertainty uh, just was uh, stimulating all kinds of anxiety and fear and apprehension in our community and in our profession. And as the COVID-19 uh, as it reached pandemic levels, I heard people saying that we were all in the same boat, but I didn't really 
ever that didn't really ever resonate with me. Uh, I instead heard another saying that said, we're not in the same boat, we're in the same storm. Our boats are all unique and uh, different. And that really stuck with me. And as I uh, tried to navigate my school through the process of reopening and uh, working with the task force, and I'm glad Susan here is here. She was my partner uh, on the task force. Um, I, we both tried to keep in mind that not all schools are the same and not all classrooms are the same. And so I think that's very important for us today to, to remember. Um, I believe that one of the things that we have to remember is that we don't have all the answers. No one does yet. And so I want, I also want to keep that in mind. Um, so I believe that everyone involved in the creation of the FSMTB guidelines would freely admit that it was impossible uh, for us to predict what's going to happen next. And um, as a result, this, this, these guidelines aren't a remedy for every solution. Um, also, they've been written um, as a national guideline. And so uh, you, you have to interpret them into your school or into your practice uh, or into your state. Uh, for an example of that would be, you don't have to rip up the carpet in your treatment room just because it says mop the floors every day. Okay, that, that wasn't the intent. Um, even though massage and body work has uh, been classified as a low to medium risk for occupational exposure, uh, without appropriate measures, as we all know, uh, like sanitation and using personal protective devices, uh, the, the rate of transmission in our profession would be huge. Um, due to the nature of our close contact service, uh, I just think that it behooves us all to, to think about uh, the surroundings that we're in and the environment in, that we're going to be teaching in or practicing in. And to remember that these guidelines are probably going to change in the future as new information comes about, as we um, get um, not only um, more information, but as uh, we get more metric on the the disease itself and how widespread and uh, just we just don't have enough information. Um, I, I I would like to open up everything by saying that uh, thank you to the alliance. Uh, for giving me an opportunity and a platform to talk today. Uh, but secondly, I want to make it very clear that I'm not a spokesperson for the Federation today or for the task force. I'm here as an educator and a peer to share with my colleagues uh, some things that I think are uh, tremendously important and that I'm really proud of. Um, I was honored to be quite frank uh, and humbled to be asked to be a part of this task force that, in my opinion, brought some of the most brilliant minds in our industry together uh, to solve a serious dilemma. Um, I have to admit, it was quite intimidating to uh, be on this task force because the, some, a lot of my heroes in the industry were on this task force. And so it was quite intimidating at times uh, but I felt like the work was so important and vital to our profession that I just had to dive in head first. Um, and so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if I can get the technology to work. There we go. So the intent of the task force was um, to bring together subject matter experts to research and prepare practice guidelines and share um, best practices for the massage and bodywork practitioners during the global COVID pandemic. And one of the things that I'll say is that um, it was a, a rather daunting task as we started this because we were on a, a kind of a crunch deadline. 
Um, we had uh, about two weeks uh, to get everything done. Uh, and so it, it meant that um, we had to do a lot of work and we had to do it quickly. Oops, wrong way, sorry. <laughs> um, the intent of the work was to help uh, the agency and boards across the country, um, massage boards uh, across the country, along with uh, practitioners and moreover uh, schools uh, and uh, instructors, people that are on the front line of doing the work, uh, stay protected uh, as we began to lift those stay at home or safer at home orders and practitioners and schools uh, went back uh, into the classrooms and to the treatment rooms. Um, <clears throat> I apologize for the technology. I am struggling for a second. Um, as we released the guidelines, we began to receive a lot uh, of overwhelming positive feedback about the uh, work that we had done. Uh, we got a lot of praise from the massage boards and agencies across the country, as well as individual practitioners and educators. Um, uh, the appreciation that we got on social media was touching as we heard people talk about how these guidelines had helped relieve their fears and anxieties about going back to work. I personally had a lot of school owners and administrators and educators reach out to me and talk to me about how to best implement the guidelines and how to educate their students on staying safe. Um, most of these people were generally um, concerned about their schools and concerned about their students. Of course, not everyone was enthusiastic about the guidelines. Um, we had some unusual comments and some adversarial comments uh, from a few people, uh, but most of those were reactions out of fear, uh, usually as a result of some type of misinformation that they had received. Um, I think we can all relate to all of the rumors and uh, misinformation uh, that was running rampant on social media. But overall, I believe the guidelines were well received. And I think that it's a project that um, has helped a lot of people so far. Um, I know that as a task force, we were really committed and concerned about producing the highest quality product uh, that we could in the least amount of time because we knew people were starting to head back into the classrooms and into the treatment rooms and we wanted to be able to get the information into as many hands as possible as quickly as possible and so we collectively agreed during our first meeting that we would do this as quick as possible but that we weren't going to sacrifice any quality uh, for speed. And so I think we stuck to that, but I think turning this project around in two weeks was a phenomenal uh, occurrence. Um, I'm just noticing that my slides are changing, but yours aren't. So I'm sorry about that. Um, we spent a lot of long days uh, having independent calls and longer nights working on our individual assignments and we spent weekends and um, I had to do CPR at one point. Um, we had a, a guy working here who had um, an accident and took the power out. So I was trying to make the call, but he he's okay. Um, but overall, after all the lengthy conversations and calls, it was, it, it, it was a very good experience um, for, I believe, for all of us. Um, the process that we went through uh, demanded uh, that, that we make sure everything that we put into this report could be uh, validated. Uh, intellectual honesty has always been uh, tremendously important to FSMTB, and the individuals that worked on the task force were absolutely committed throughout the project to maintaining intellectual honesty and went out of 
uh, our way to avoid uh, any kind of egocentric agendas during the acquisition of all of the data uh, that was used during the product or the project. Um, and when we looked at the information, we now know that um, it's been reviewed and that um, we used a very rigorous uh, validation of that data and the metadata that contributed uh, that was contributed from each of the task force members. Uh, we used uh, triangulation uh, as a means to cross validate data and we used uh, a variety of methods to collect data on the same topic so that we could um, make sure that the, the information came from more than one source if possible. Still running slow. Um, after we were uh, finished with the writing, uh, we had uh, the national organizations peer review it, uh, ABMP, uh, AMTA, COMPTA, and NCB, TMB all provided feedback on the uh, document. Uh, in doing so, I think that the uh, peer review uh, helped us maintain transparency about the, the process and helped us uh, really come to uh, a product that is uh, valid and um, uses guidelines that are nation nationally being uh, put out from other organizations, uh, but uh, in a way that are that's applicable to our industry and our profession. Um, the overarching uh, idea of the guidelines is that um, of public protection and that pr public protection was uh, job one for both clients, practitioners, students, uh, and educators. Um, throughout the guidelines, we uh, referred to other organizations' publications, uh, all of the resources that we cited in the publications were consulted so that national experts in the fields of infectious disease control and prevention, public health and industrial hygiene uh, checked our facts and our conclusions. And um, it allowed us to make sure that we had removed uh, any uh, erroneous information prior to dissemination. Um, it's important for people to realize that guidelines are exactly that. Um, they're guidelines. Um, a guideline is not a law and it's not a regulation, but it is a, uh, an, a tool for you to use to make sure that you have information uh, as you try to navigate through what lies ahead as, as you open your practice or your um, school back up. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to provide guidelines that would be both meaningful and practical to the end user. Uh, and it's important that people who um, use this document understand that they have to still follow local, state, and federal guidelines and regulations uh, for their area. Um, The um, guidelines were written to support the safest possible return uh, to work, but it doesn't eliminate all of the the uh, risk. Uh, and so I have to I have to be very upfront in saying that there's still a minor risk, even though our profession is low to medium risk. There's still risk, and so it calls for our practitioners and our educators. Uh, to hold uh, patients and students to a higher standard, to be more vigilant in our sanitation practices and in our personal hygiene practices. Um, <clears throat> I think the role of the educator uh, in all of this is to decrease student fear. I know that in my 
school, we've had to have multiple meetings because students um, have expressed uh, fear in going back into the classroom, fear in going back to the, the uh, treatment rooms as student therapists. Um, and so I think that as educators uh, and administrators in schools, I think that uh, it would certainly be the right thing to do to take these guidelines and, and to digest them and to be able to talk fluently about them. Hello, Kitty. Um, because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, the guidelines themselves were broken down into easy to find topics uh, so that it's almost like a checklist. And so school administrators can go through and go item to item. Educators can go through and make sure that they're following all the guidelines for the classroom area. Um, I think that it is pivotal that educators implement a thorough and decisive plan inside the classroom. I also think that all schools should have uh, a plan in place so that um, everybody is on the same page and that people are not um, going rogue and doing their own thing as we enter uh, and the new normal, as they're calling it, uh, for massage and bodywork education. Um, they're very easy to follow guidelines. Like I said, the information was written in a user-friendly format uh, so that it could be easily understood. Uh, the document is broken down into sections uh, for simplicity of reference. Uh, like I said earlier, it's like a checklist. Um, and I really think that um, this document is not going to just help us uh, with uh, the COVID-19 crisis. I think that as new uh, disease emerges, we're already ready and prepared for that. Um, but, but as a fallback, these are also the things that we should be doing when we hit the flu and cold season. Um, and that we should be able, to be able to moderate to what extent we use the information that's contained in this, uh, the guidelines. Um, at the end of the guide, there's uh, an appendix, and in that there's uh, an action plan for if someone uh, tests positive for COVID, um, there's an addendum that you can add to your intake and there's just a simple notice that uh, we used as a model uh, that you could use in your practice. Uh, I think that a lot of times we are expected to, to just know how to do all of this and so here we've given some, some samples so that you can start to have um, perhaps some, some verbiage and, and wording for things that you might need. Um, all of the information in the um, guidelines uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm more than willing to answer questions about any of it, uh, but I believe that it's so simple that it's self-explanatory. Now, I know that not everybody has it, and so if you need a copy, just simply go to the FSMDB website. Uh, the, on the home page, there's a learn more button that you can click and download it. Um, it's, um, I'd say it's, it's for the amount of time that it was put together, it's an amazing piece of work. Um, and I'm really proud uh, to be a part of it. Um, I'm also very uh, thankful for all the people who were on the task force. Uh, at the end of the um, guide, there's a list of the people who participated in the guide or in the creation of the guide. Um, I, I will say thank you to Susan because she was such a good partner. I, I really enjoyed the experience of, of putting our information together 
And also, um, I would like to say um, uh, just thank you to the FSMTB for for pulling this project together. Uh, I think that it's vital if you were on social media whatsoever, uh, and I know a lot of you are still in lockdown, but as we as we were coming out of lockdown, all of this was happening. So it was a great blessing to us because we were the ones who had all the questions because we were about to go back into the classrooms and and we were preparing our plans and everything. So I really am grateful to FSMTB and to the FSMTB staff for all of their hard work and dedication and, and I'm uh, also to the board of directors for FSMTB. So uh, that's just a little bit about it. I know there's going to be more specific questions and I'm open to any questions that you might have. Okay, I'm going to jump back in and say thank you very much. Uh, 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 the dog's going to bark. Uh oh, um, for that presentation, Ed. Uh, just to remind everybody, um, because we want you to be free to speak here, uh, you can raise your hand if we can see you to ask a question, or you can unmute yourselves. But I am going to stop the recording here, so everyone will have a chance to speak freely. And um, and so, uh, who wants to start with the first couple of questions? And I would ask also Bob if you would. Uh, help to monitor the chat just in, things, in case things come up. You're doing that very well. So thanks very much.